Hi, I'm Micah Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. <sighs> U.S. policy in the Middle East is charting new waters. Washington is advancing in ways that no government has ever advanced, and they are now trying to explain themselves, explaining that it was part of the peace plan for the Middle East, specifically for peace between Israel and the Palestinians. In December of 2017, the new U.S. administration recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital and then proceeded to open its embassy in the new capital. The Trump White House argued that it was not only the right thing to do, but it was also a wise decision. They explained that the real peace plan must be based on reality and that not recognizing that the obvious only stymies any worthwhile agreement that might be reached. Obviously, Israelis were elated by the decision and subsequent embassy opening. The hoopla surrounding the new embassy opening was televised live and watched both at home in Israel and abroad. And just as obviously, the Palestinians were livid. Every step of the process, every moment of airtime, every editorial and op-ed fanned their flame of distrust with the United States. And just as obviously, it was clear to any student of foreign policy that one day soon, the Palestinians would get their fair share from the Trump administration. And in order to make that happen, the peace deal that the Trump administration one day puts forward will be predicated on the fact that Israel compromises on some very serious issues. As big as the prize of Jerusalem is for Israel, that's how big the compromise Israel will be expected to make to please the Palestinians. And yet, when President Donald Trump hinted that that expectation in a campaign speech delivered in West Virginia, Israelis were taken by surprise. Speaking of the Palestinians, the president said, and I'm quoting here, but they'll get something very good because it's their turn next. Let's see what happens, unquote. Was the president of the United States articulating a shift in policy? No, he was not. He was merely citing a well-worn dictate of his famous art of the deal. What exactly that something very big will be, we still don't know. It could be that the president and his team still don't even know. But as the president continued to point out, recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital city will require Israel to pay, quote, a higher price, unquote, for U.S.-sponsored peace with the Palestinians. The United States National Security Advisor John Bolton was in Israel when President Trump made his comments at the campaign rally. During the press conference that Bolton held to discuss the central Middle East issues, he was asked about the president's comments. In response, Bolton clearly emphasized that, the pre that President Trump's reference to Israel paying a higher price in future peace negotiations in return for the United States' recognition of Jerusalem as the country's capital did not suggest there was, as he put it, an issue of quid pro quo. One of the reasons it might not be a quid pro quo is because the Palestinians have so far rejected any suggestions made by the United States and even refused to meet with the president's negotiating team. To date, the Palestinian leadership has responded in unison. They have rejected all moves by President Trump, calling them patronizing and insulting. It's hard to have a quid without the quo. To make a deal, any deal, both sides have to compromise on significant issues. U.S. administration after administration has tried valiantly to get the Israelis and the Palestinians to sit together at the negotiating table. On the few instances they have successfully gotten them to the table, no administration has successfully kept them there. In line with his leadership style, Donald Trump is coming at it from a very different angle. Previous administrations saw the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians in a very monodimensional way. Israel, they would say, you have what the Palestinians want. Give them a little and everyone will be happy. That paradigm failed. All the heavy work, all the expectations, the asking, the giving, all fell squarely on the shoulders of Israel. And even when they did give, think Gaza, let's say for instance, it failed miserably. In the new paradigm, the Palestinians are forced to see the reality of Jerusalem as the capital city of Israel. The Palestinians need to join the conversation. The Latin expression quid pro quo means something for something. It means I give you this and you give me that. It is a system of barter. Another Latin phrase, one that better describes the idea but lacks the alliteration, is do ut ses. I, it means I give so that you may give. In other words, the second compromise is predicated 
on the first. Without the first move, the second would not and could not happen. Right now, neither side is moving. And neither side will move until the big questions are answered. What will it take to once again inspire the Palestinians to participate in peace talks with the Israelis? And how large an ask will the United States require of Israel? So, Donald Trump and John Bolton, there may not yet be a quid pro quo, but there will indeed be a do et ut ses, a very big do et ses. Now moving on to Iran. Sanctions hurt and Iran is feeling the pain. The Persian nation has begun to feel the sting of the sanctions imposed upon them by the United States. And this is just the beginning, just the first stage. The pain will intensify come November 4th, when the second stage of sanctions takes effect. That's good news. A defanged Iran translates into a safer Middle East and a better world. It's the simple truth. The not so good news is that the sanctions also necessitate collateral damage. And there are industries, companies, and countries that stand to sustain significant losses because the United States chose to impose sanctions on Iran. The airline industry has already started to make accommodations to meet the new sanctions and is shuffling around their schedules. British Air, Air France, and KLM have stopped all flights to Iran. The European banking industry is also beginning to share Iran's pain. And so there is a plan afoot to find a way around the sanctions without defying the sanctions at the same time. U.S. Congress, under the initiative led by former presidential hopeful Texas Senator Ted Cruz, is attempting to further step up the pressure on Iran and remove them from SWIFT, the Money Transfer Service. SWIFT stands for the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication. It is the safest and best way to transfer monies almost everywhere in today's world. SWIFT took the banking industry out of the wire and telex transfers and catapulted it into the world of telecommunication. The old system had no central code system for bank identification. It was not secured, and it was, at best, haphazard. With SWIFT, over 200 countries and tens of thousands of banks are in sync and connected through codes. The SWIFT system is based out of Belgium, but because of the U.S. banking involvement in it, it falls under U.S. federal banking supervision. It is U.S. involvement that makes using SWIFT safer and more protected than other methods of money transfer. It is also a system that guards against pitfalls of money laundering, a favorite tool of terrorists and drug kingpins, and it also serves as a protection against potential financial crashes. As a supervising body, the United States receives information about all transactions taking place via SWIFT. In essence, the combination of SWIFT and U.S. law makes certain that banks are not used to help carry out nefarious, destructive, and murderous deeds. That includes terrorist activities perpetrated by Iran, ISIS, and Al-Qaeda all around the world. Certain forces in parts of Europe and China are trying to create an alternative to SWIFT, which would avoid those safeguards that are so valuable. German's Foreign Minister Heike Maas is at the forefront of the movement to create another independent SWIFT-like money transfer system, specifically in order to keep the United States off their back and out of their Iranian-related hair. If the plan works, the implications are devastating, and the impact will be far greater than the U.S. sanctions against Iran. Moss's plan was outlined in a very long piece in the German daily Handelblatt. The foreign minister laid out a strategy to check the United States and to create a counterbalance to the United States. He uses that term counterbalance several times in the essay, especially when pointing out how the United States has overstepped their role and crossed, to use his expression, red lines. Translation, the United States is interfering big time with their business dealings in Iran. Moss wrote, and this is a quote, in this situation, it is of strategic significance that we say clearly to Washington, we want to work together, but we will not allow you to act over our heads to our detriment. That is why it was right to legally protect European countries from sanctions. That is why it is indispensable to strengthen European autonomy by setting up payment channels that are independent of the U.S., creating a European monetary fund and setting up an independent SWIFT system. If Europe follows through and succeeds in developing an independent money transfer system, 
there is certain to be a flaw in that security systems network. A central axiom in that system will certainly be the protection of anonymity, which means they're anonymous. And that is nothing but a glorified open invitation for those who engage in terror and illegal activity. It will make cryptocurrency like bitcoins and the like look transparent. China would love this. It's a whole new banking system. The underbelly of the world will jump all over it. The lack of supervision and the fact that there will be no reporting or regulations are too enticing to pass up. U.S. banking regu regulations are very strict, much stricter than in Europe, or China for that matter. Creating an alternative to SWIFT will successfully insulate Iran's banking industry from the United States' actions and prevent the ultimate victory over Iran that the United States is working towards. It has a very real potential to destabilize the region by keeping Iran above water and out of reach. If successful, this will be a huge blow to American banks, which have until now, through the use of SWIFT, been the conduit for world business. Those promoting this suggestion want to help themselves by helping Iran. They are being short-sighted. What they will really be doing is hurting the West and hurting the Middle East, including, of course, hurting Israel. Coming up next, point of view. Here's what some important voices have been talking about. Both of these columns come from the New York Post. First up is entitled, The Long Road to Nazi Labor Camp Guard, Yakiv Palizh's Removal. And it's by Brian Allen Pinskovsky. Pinskovsky is Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division at the Justice Department. It was published on August 26, 2018. And as usual, it appeared online the day before on August 25th. This is the story of a prison guard from a Nazi death camp who made it to New York City after the war and was just deported now, if you can imagine that, in August of 2018. This is how the piece begins. The removal to Germany last week of Yakiv Palij, a longtime Queens resident and former Nazi SS labor camp guard, is a triumph of justice and accountability for the victims of Nazi atrocities. And it's an example of what persistent diplomacy can achieve. Palish stood as an armed guard over some 6,000 soon-to-be-executed Jews in Travinki, in German-occupied Poland during World War II. After the war, he unlawfully and fraudulently immigrated to the United States. A U.S. immigration judge ordered him removed in 2004. The fact that it took more than 14 years to carry out the removal that removal order showed that Nazi criminals have been able to evade justice even within our own borders. What took so long? The answer begins with the painful history but ends at long last with last week's triumph of justice. This story is shocking. How could this have happened here in the United States? Wyskrensky continues. In the spring of 1945, World War II entered its closing weeks in Europe. America's brave fighting forces encountered gruesome sights, unimaginable, even amid the horrors of the war, as they liberated Dachau and Nordhausen concentration camps and other now infamous sites of Nazi persecution. U.S. soldiers gave life-saving aid to Jewish and other survivors of these camps and apprehended the perpetrators who could be found. The United States, its allies, and the governments of the liberated countries prosecuted and punished thousands of Nazi war criminals. But many eluded capture. Some of the most heavily implicated Nazi criminals became subjects of international manhunts, such as Adolf Eichmann, who was apprehended in Argentina in 1960 by Israeli agents, then tried, convicted, and put to death. Other lesser-known offenders, however, masqueraded as victims of the Nazis and fraudulently immigrated to the United States and other countries. Now the author concludes that the Trump administration pressured Germany until they took Paris. On August 21st, ICE agents escorted Palij back to Germany aboard a chartered plane. Palij's removal demonstrates the necessity of safeguarding the benefit of American citizenship from fraudulent cases and makes clear that participants in Nazi crimes and other human rights violators, whether in the Balkans, Central America, or elsewhere around the world, will find no safe haven on American soil, even in their old age. Second up, is also from a column from the New York Post. This piece appeared online August 26th and in print on August 28th. It was written by Benny Avni, one of New York Post's best columnists. The column is actually entitled, Trump is busting the myths that prevent Middle East peace. 
The essay explains the U.S. president's point of view in reducing Palestinian refugees, which lowers the number from 5 million to 500,000. Avni begins, slowly but surely, President Trump is slaying the sacred cows of Palestinian-Israeli diplomacy. Last week, the State Department announced a $200 million cut in annual aid to the Palestinian Authority. Before that, America cut support for the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, a body created in 1949 to tend to some 750,000 Arab refugees from the war Israel's neighbors launched to erase it off the map. UNRWA now handles over 5 million refugee camp residents in Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, the West Bank, and Gaza. It exclusively tends to Palestinians, while another UN agency deals with refugees everywhere else on the globe. Next, Washington reportedly plans to announce a cap of 500,000 refugees UNRWA can handle. Further, they'll be counted as other refugees are counted instead of the expansive way only Palestinian refugees are counted, which includes multi-generational descendants. The status of UNRWA refugee conflicts with the UN definition. Avni ends by reinforcing the idea that Trump is correct when it comes to this definition, despite the fact that refugees have been a third rail for Palestinians uh, across all negotiations. Coming up, commentary through cartoons, where pictures tell the story. All the pieces today come from Powerline blog. The first is a message on a board near a road. The message reads, if attacked by a mob of clowns, go for the jugular. That's very funny. Non-political, just funny, and a wonderful play on words. Next up is a cartoon by Shavel, and it's called Truth and Post-Truth. Under the truth, there's a character looking like the great philosopher Cervantes, and he says, I think, therefore, I am. The post-truth guy, looking very modern, says, I believe, therefore, I'm right. Again, very, very funny. Last up is the infamous Peanuts by George Schultz. And it also was published on Powerline blog. Charlie Brown says, there are four panels here. Charlie Brown says to Schroeder, I wish to engage you in a thoughtful debate over the existence of the great pumpkin. If you accept, I will donate $10,000 to your favorite charity. Schroeder shouts, stop catcalling. The next frame has Charlie Brown simply staring at Schroeder. And the final frame has Charlie Brown saying the following, that's the most depressing thing I ever heard. In a moment, more of my own predictions and the few perspectives. Thirteen Russian warships crossed through the Bosphorus Straits en route to Syria. The Bosphorus leads from the Black Sea to Marmara, to the Aegean Sea, and then to the Mediterranean. The ships are the most sophisticated and advanced attack machines in the entire Russian war chest. This flotilla is a floating attack base. It is an offensive weapon with the express purpose of striking targets on land. It is not a defensive system. This return of the Russian armada to Syria is the result of President Trump's announcement threatening that the United States was going to attack Syrian army posts. Russia is sending its fleet to defend Syria, its ally, and to check the United States' aggression in the region. They will begin with naval maneuvers. Iran's parliament ordered Iranian President Hassan Rouhani to make an appearance and explain his policies. This is only the second time in history that such a move has been taken. The last time was in 2011 when then-President Ahmadinejad was summoned to the parliament over a similar issue, international sanctions against Iran. Rouhani was asked to explain why his policies have not been able to counter the sanctions imposed by the United States on Iran. The parliament is worried, most significantly because the economic crisis in Iran is worsening. And this is just one stage of the sanctions. Stage two begins November 4th. Iran's parliamentarians want to know what Rouhani's plans are. They want to know if Rouhani's plans will succeed in lifting Iran out of its terrible economic condition. If you are Iranian, there is good reason to worry. The anchor for Israel's public television station, Khan, a woman named Geula Evan Saar, made several comments that many people considered offensive. Numerous people have eulogized Uri Avniri, a trial-blazing leftist, in response to the tributes heaped on Avniri Evan Saar said in the broadcast, quote, Today many people have eulogized him, including President Ruben Rivlin, 
but also labor leader Jeremy Corbyn and Palestinian Authority President Abu Mazen Abbas, who don't have a problem eulogizing terrorists. Gula Evan Saar is correct in that Jeremy Corbyn supports Palestinian terror, as does Abu Mazen. She ab abandoned professionalism totally, and she expressed her anger at these leaders. Avneri was the first Israeli to meet and greet PLO leader Yasser Arafat, who was also a terrorist. The anchor is unapologetic and stands by her words. Dan Kramer is the lead member of Israel's equestrian team. The team has a chance to qualify for the 2020 Summer Olympics in Japan. But to qualify, they need to score high in certain international competitions. The best competition will take place in September in the United States. But there's a problem. The competition takes place on Yom Kippur. Dan Kramer was insistent that he personally would not compete on Yom Kippur. He said out of respect for Judaism and out of respect for the Israeli people, he would not compete. Kramer has written an open letter that reads, and I'm quoting here, I decided not to join the other members of the Israeli national team and not to participate in the upcoming world championships in the United States because the competition is taking place on Yom Kippur. And I want to honor this day as well as the Israeli public and, the, and Jewish diaspora. I think that it will be a serious mistake in judgment to compete on this holy day, despite the sporting implications of not participating in such a major and important competition that will hurt my international score and my and my horse's chances of reaching the Olympics. As far as I'm concerned, this is not a matter of personal choice. As a Jewish athlete and a proud Israeli, I do not intend to offend the sensitivities of the Israeli public and the Jewish world in general and compete on our holiest day. I do not intend to compete below the radar, as has been hinted to me more than once in my conversations with key people in the Federation, because I believe that every performance by an Israeli team should be a heartwarming affair that fills every Israeli and Jew with pride. The rest of the team has decided to compete. They are, however, split in favor of and opposed to the decision of their team captain. The truth is that without Kramer, Israel's equestrian team's chances of reaching the Olympics is greatly diminished. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. Did you know that we use quite a lot of Latin in our everyday English? Today, I used Latin while talking about diplomacy. Why do we use so much Latin? Latin is one of the basic foundations of our language, our science, our law, and our philosophy. Latin is one of the classical languages, along with Greek and Hebrew. The classics were composed or translated into Latin, Greek, or Hebrew. It is a very precise language. That is why science is filled with Latin. Our legal system is heavily influenced by Latin and Roman law. Like Hebrew, Latin was the language of religious texts. Even the Hebrew Bible was translated into Latin. It was called the Vulgate, or the Old Latin Bible. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Micah Halpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.